Uh, good evening, everybody. Lovely to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you, actually. It's always good to be back in my hometown, even though it's a bit vicarious this evening, which is, I say, must say, very disappointing. Um, it's also nice to speak on such a cheery topic as pandemics. Um, I suppose uh, it'll hopefully it'll make everybody feel good to be alive that we're still around in spite of all the issues that are facing us. Um, Lindsay did ask me about visual aids. Um, I'm not desperately good at those and it didn't seem there was much I could illustrate anyway. But it made me recall quite a while ago I uh, organized a conference at which the chief rabbi was speaking and I asked him the same question, would he require audio visual aids? And he said, I am an audio visual aid. <laughs> Um, well, let me, let me begin with a, a trivia question. Uh, there may be a chocolate smarty as a reward if uh, anyone can get it. Um, it's quite easy, actually. What have Walt Disney, David Lloyd George, Mary Pickford, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Emperor Haile Selassie, Lillian Gish, Clementine Churchill, Woodrow Wilson, Mahatma Gandhi, Greta Garbo, and Kaiser William II have in common? Well... The answer is they all suffered from the Spanish flu. So it sh just shows how, how much it got about. Um, I'll begin with a quote from an eminent source. Um, we have been living for several months a snail's life. We shirk, we shirk and hide ourselves indoors and are as, as best as bust as bees in study. There is a great solitude here. Most people away for fear of the plague. I'm determined to take flight. If nothing else, I would like to die elsewhere. And that was words of Erasmus in 1513. And he was in Cambridge at the time. Um, his fear of the plague was only uh, exceeded by his dislike of Cambridge. I think he was one of nature's Ox Oxford men, actually. Um, but it all goes to show that there's nothing new under the sun. And this evening, I intend to prove it. But before I do that, I'm going to start in a way you probably weren't expecting by reading a short extract from a paper I wrote on pandemics um, for the Interaction Council of Ex-Heads of State and Government. I should have delivered this uh, a year ago next month in Valletta, Malta. The, the conference was then put off after last October, then cancelled again. It's now for next October, so I'm not even sure I'll ever get to deliver this. So. This little extract is the nearest I'll probably get to delivering it. Um, but uh, the point really is that influential viral strains are changing const constantly, as we know, in subtle ways. As a result, the human immune system may mount imperfect responses to them. The usual result is seasonal influenza, typically occupying the winter months in temperate climates like the UK, Rarely a radically altered strain of the virus emerges to which the human population has little or no immunity. Should that strain be efficiently transmitted from human to human, be easily transmissible before symptoms occur and have the ability to replicate, then conditions may favor the occurrence of a pandemic. The major factor in the spread of pandemics has been the increasing ease of transportation around the globe over the past century and a half. The influenza A virus, popularly known as swine flu pandemic of 2009, spread globally within eight weeks of its first diagnosis. By contrast, the pandemic that appeared in 1739 was first identified in Russia, spreading southwards and westwards across Europe. Reoccurrence began in 1739 too, again in Russia, after 1733, there were pronounced global influenza-like activity, which lasted sporadically till 1747, causing extraordinary death rates in certain areas. Whether this 18-year cycle was one pandemic or was caused by a series of mutations is uncertain. There have been four recorded influenza pandemics in the last 100 years or so. In 1918, 1957, 1968 and 2009. By far the worst of these was the outbreak of 1918, which resulted in more deaths world war, worldwide than the Great War, the worst pandemic in recorded history. It represents one of the most feared worst case scenarios. The 1918 outbreak was actually the first of two pandemics which occurred between 1918 and December 1920, 
involving the HINI influenza virus. It infected an estimated 500 million people worldwide, including remote Pacific Islands and the Arctic, and killed an estimated 50 to 100 million people, three to 5% of the world's population. Most outbreaks disproportionately kill juvenile, elderly, or already weakened patients. By contrast, the 1918 pandemic predominantly killed previously healthy young adults. Modern research using viruses taken from the bodies of frozen victims has concluded that it killed through a psychogland storm. This is a potential fatal immune system reaction consisting of a positive feedback loop between cytokines and black, white blood cells with highly elevated levels of cytokines causing an overreaction of the body's immune system. The strong immune reactions of young adults ravage the body whereas the weaker immune systems of children and older adults resulted in fewer deaths among these groups. It is estimated that such an outbreak worldwide occurs on average once every 40 years, although hopefully not with the same devastating effect as Spanish flu. Such a future pandemic could arise in any location. Many of the historic pandemics seem to have originated in China or Southeast Asia. These regions may serve as efficient incubators for new influenza subtypes with the air round circulation of viruses coupled to a, the close living quarters of humans with domestic animals. The intense and industrial scale rearing of animals that harbor the influenza virus in the West could however be equally the source of a future pandemic. Well, that's the end of the little bit of background, which I thought would be useful to have because it, um, it's obviously something that happens every so often and that we're not over them yet. Significant pandemic events on the historical record have included waves of inf infection that have lasted for approximately 16 weeks with the peak two weeks into each wave accounting for 50% of infection. Such a wave could cause people to be bed bound for seven to 10 days. The interval between waves of infection has varied from weeks to months. Doubtless, Stratford suffered as much as everywhere else during the so-called Black Death, a term not used at the time, by the way. It first appeared in the 1750s. The first pandemic in Stratford, of which there is some level of record, occurred, I think Lindsay mentioned this already, in 1564. If you're not familiar with who was born then, perhaps uh, you shouldn't be in the Stratford Society, but I'll give you a clue. Here he is. There he is. That's the chap. Um, and I think Lindsay mentioned as well that, um, the, the, uh, that we're lucky to have William Shakespeare at all. He narrowly escaped a little winding sheet in the first weeks of his life. On July the 11th, 1564, Oliver Gunn, an apprentice weaver, died at premises, now the Garrick Inn. I think it's quite safe in there once they reopen, so don't get worried, uh, in the High Street. In the burial entry, the vicar John Brechtgirdle wrote the ominous words, Hic incipit pestis. The plague had been carried into England by soldiers returning from the Earl of Leicester's expedition against La Havre. Before the year was out, 238 inhabitants had died, around an eighth of the population of Stratford. It was by far the worst epidemic in Stratford's history. As Lindsay said, Mary Shakespeare may have fled back to her parental home in Wilcott with her baby. Her husband stayed to attend the corporation meet, meeting of August the 30th, held in the Guild Garden, rather than the stuffy atmosphere of the hall. With the graveyard at Holy Trinity overwhelmed, plague pits would have been created on the outskirts of town to bury the dead. Bob Behrman has suggested that one of these was at where Shottery Road meets the Evesham Road. Significantly, uh, you may not know this, um, Shottery Road was historically known as Dead Lane. Um, so it was near the old level crossing, if any of you recall that. Perhaps it's a sign of some conscious deference. It was not built upon for years, that particular plot. Over the centuries, there have been many pandemics and each one is new territory. Stratford's response to the devastating outbreak of plague in 1645 illustrates this. People were moved to a specially built village of pest houses at a place called the Hill, which was probably a welcome together with the, their animals. They were paid eight, eight pence a day subsistence allowance what we'd now call furloughing, I suppose. Uh, the um, people, 
were paid to tend them. There'd be frontline support staff, as we say now. The carers provided with prunes, sugar, and cinnamon. Um, cinnamon was regarded as a wonderful, you may know this, uh, the great um, cure all of everything. You know, there are even wars fought about it, Portuguese and Dutch, to get control of the spice trade in the Indian Ocean. Um, and uh, the Romans swore by cinnamon as a curative. 2,000 years of clinical practice surely can't be written off. I, I looked it up just now and uh, there are still people swearing by cinnamon. So my advice is always to have a little bit of cinnamon to hand if you want to avoid all possible plagues and afflictions. The town's response to the disaster is uniquely recorded. And I think it's uniquely. I've never seen anything like it anywhere else. There's a full record of what the people of Stratford-on-Avon did in 1645, faced with the bubonic plague. It's not dissimilar to that um, Eom, the place in Derbyshire where they isolated themselves. Um, but it's called, and it's in the birth, it's in the record office uh, at the Birthplace Trust. A note: What hath been paid to the infected of the plague and kept up for fear of further spreading. It represents a tale of suffering, but also a community at its best organizing with compassion for the common good. On May the 24th, 16 people were registered as infected. The first payments are two shillings to William Adams for drawing a corpse to grave and two and sixpence for a man called Granums for burying a corpse. This is John Granums who is listed as infected, presumably because he had been in contact with infected people. He was paid five pence a day. His wife, Mary and Richard Rogers who were in charge of the isolation colony were paid eight pence a day. A graveyard was established near the site and the sufferer's livestock pastured in a nearby field. Sixpence was paid to George Bridges for covering of graves and for works in the field and fourpence to William Hornby for work in the field about pest houses. As the number of sufferers increased, the accommodation expanded. Five men were paid eightpence each for helping to set up the pest houses. Digging a grave for a child cost a fee of fourpence as against sixpence for an adult. During the first week of June, the Austin family was decimated. Making a grave for Austin's boy reads the first entry of the month. Sixpence was paid for making a grave for Austin's wench, but this included the cost of sugar and candles. One shilling was expended for a sheet to wrap Austin's wife in. The final entry for the week repays Alexander Hornby the half crown he paid Mary Gannams to bury one of Austin's children. This considerable sum must cover other unrecorded services. The death rate increased with the summer heat. Coffins were ordered in bulk. George Cole was paid nine and fourpence for boards, pitch, nail, cord, and making coffins for the infected that died, and more which he laid out for Mountford's wife and son. George Briggs was paid for drawing the corpse and making a grave for good wife Mountford and for making Mountford's son's grave. On June the 15th, George Badger was, Badger was paid fourpence for making a grave for Francis Cooper's mother-in-law and tenpence for Cook's wife's grave for helping draw the corpse. Two pence, tuppence was paid for sugar candy for Cook's wench and two pence for a peck of brams for their swine. After July the 9th, when George Bridges was paid a shilling for making the graves and hauling the coffin for Clark's wife and child, the plague could no longer be isolated but was rife in the alleys of the town. On August the 2nd, two and sixpence was paid to the infested in the Sheep Street maze. To coax people into isolation, they were paid in advance. Two and six was given on August the 9th to task her a, week, a week's pay beforehand to remove unto the hill. By the autumn, the disease was on the decline. 61 people had died, of whom 41 lived in the borough. The district levies were particularly predictably slow in appearing. On September the 24th, six and fourpence were received of Hampton Episcopi, that's Hampton Lucy, a fortnight's payment, for, but other places were not as forthcoming. In October, George Cooper was paid a shilling for going to Claverton and other towns about money for the infected. It must have been with muted joy that on January the 21st, 1646, two shillings was paid to Robert Taylor for pulling down the pest houses. This was the last recorded outbreak of bubonic plague in Stratford, but the town's insanitary state made further epidemics virtually inevitable. Horace Walpole, the writer, found Stratford the wretchedest old town that I ever saw. Insanitary conditions prevailed. 
The ditch along Chapel Lane was the receptacle for all manner of filth that any cho person chose to put there and was very obnoxious at times. The inevitable sequel was disease. A new scourge emerged from the East. The smallpox is really my school as fast as it can, wrote the master of the free school, the Reverend Joseph Green in 1747. A survey in 1765 showed that 1,260 of the about 2,287 inhabitants had suffered from smallpox. The great Russian flu of the 1730s and 1740s may have passed Stratford by or not. Corporate affairs in the town were dominated by lethargy. And of course, there was no local media to cover any epidemic that might have occurred. With a new century, there were those in Stratford who would ensure that the lethargy of George, the Georgian era gave way to Victorian energy. One of the great heroes uh, that I think is not sufficiently remembered in Stratford is Dr. John Connolly, who became man, he became borough surgeon at the age of 27. He was appointed in 1822. This great doctor, a reformer by nature and heavily liberal in politics, ardently devoted himself to fur the furtherance of every measure of progress. His first great work was to establish a public dispensary for the sick poor at the old bank building in Chapel Street. In the first year, 330 patients were treated. In 1824, after a severe case of smallpox was diagnosed, vaccinations were organized of those on parish relief and later of other inhabitants. Connolly did not doubt that Stratfordians would comply with so respectable a recommendation, but warned that anyone wandering abroad who had been co in contact with the disease would be prosecuted. That's quite familiar. He became the first professor of medical practice at the newly founded London University. In 1839, he became resident physician at the Middlesex Asylum. His work and energy affected a revolution in the treatment of the mentally ill. He was known as the friend and guide to the crazy, probably an appropriate name for a mayor of Stratford. In 1831, a new scourge from the East Cholera arrived from India. In those days, you could watch it progressing. You know, the British had watched its slow and inevitable progress against across Asia and continental Europe. They knew it was going to inevitably arrive here. In November 1831, the first cases were recorded in Britain. The arrival of this new pandemic increased national concerns for public health, but no measures of any significance occurred in Stratford. In 1897, an old man recalled the state of the town in his youth. The streets were filled with rubbish and scarcely paid, even in the high street. The uh, drains discharged at any low spot. There were no underground sewers. A means to improvement was created by the Public Health of Towns Act of 1848, which could be implied in places where, where the mortality rate exceeded 23 per 100. Dr. Thompson, the medical officer, demonstrated that Stratford's mean death rate of 23 per, per thousand was amongst the highest in England for the town of its size. So um, one of the filthiest and least healthy quarters of the town was the Guild Pits. Many were the complaints about the offensive muck heaps and piggeries lining its town side. There was no house drainage in the town and few water closets. Drinking water was supplied by pumps and rain butts. The seven abattoirs were inadequately drained and surrounded by discarded blood and offal. The inspector's proposal was no less important for their predictability. Cattle markets should be established on the outskirts of town, nuisances removed and a decent water supply and sewage and draining system established. The cost of full implementation was estimated at a ninepenny rate to pay off capital borrowing over 30 years. An inspector of nuisances was appointed. John Tasker worked assiduously, was gravely hampered by a bureaucratic error. Although Stratford was one of the first boroughs to apply for the act to be applied, its name was inadvertently omitted from the enabling statute that left implementation to local initiative rather than the government decree. There were huge differences to those who wanted full implementation, with implementation, but it cost a lot of money, and the economists were, in fact, were cautious about costs. In the autumn of 1850, a Board of Health was established. It followed an energetic path, appointing Edward Gibbs as borough surveyor and inspectors of nuisances. The Royal Engineers began, as, began to survey the line of drains and sewers, but after the borough rate rose to a shilling in the pound, a petition was presented to the board signed by 290 of the 400 rate payers demanding the revocation of the act. Dr. Thompson replied this was not possible 
since its implementation had been requested by the inhabitants, included some of the, some of the petitioners. Charles Lucy, the miller, responded in the true spirit of philanthropy. I shall participate in non-advantages, but I will be for the benefit of the public. I shall advocate it. We still know Lucy's mill, of course. The last pipe of the sewage scheme was laid on February the 26th, 1859. It consisted of six miles of sewers and 51 ventilators. The board's achievements have been great and it changed the scope of local government in Stratford forever. Concern was increased by, in September by a renewed national epidemic. The authorities took their usual methods, but the vicar formed, favored a more transcendental approach declaring October 3rd a day of humiliation and prayer. Shops closed and businesses closed for the day. The Holy Trinity had a considerable congregation, nor did the dissenting churches permit this terrible affliction for the omnipotent to pass by unobserved. It was quite customary to invoke the Almighty during epidemics in Victorian times. George O'Bethnot, who was vicar from 1879, was a temperance campaigner whose zeal for the cause could lead him into absurdity. One of our greatest national sins, he said, is the sin of drunkenness. It is possible to my mind probable that the influenza is sent to us as a punishment for it. The influenza epidemic of which the vicar was speaking was a comparatively minor affair. In the autumn of 1918, Stratford was took, struck by a pandemic which cost more lives, as I said, than the Great War. The virus was first identified in Kansas on March the 4th and demonstrated the speed of tra transmission of which I've spoken. It reached the trenches in France just 41 days after the diagnosis of patient zero. 300,000 troop, British troops were infected, of whom 10% died. The disease had been brought across the Atlantic by the doughboys of the American Expeditionary Force. There were severe outbreaks on the troop ships. Ironically, it was first identified in Europe in Spain in May. Ironically, because Spain was one of the few European countries that was a neutral in the war. The impact was increased because one of the earliest sufferers was King Alfonso the 13th. Thus it received its popular name and inaccurate name, Spanish flu. It made a minor appearance in Stratford in May and June, probably brought by soldiers returning from the trenches as wounded or on leave. As might be expected, people treated it as nothing more than an expected seasonal outbreak. This low key approach was enhanced by government censorship. News of the outbreak was thought to be bad for the war effort. Sir Arthur Newshelm, a government health advisor, recommended that no action be taken. He wanted life to go on as normal. One of the few to realise the seriousness of the pandemic from the outset was the Medical Office of Health of Manchester, Dr James Niven. A fellow of Queen's College, Cambridge, he began examining the statistics of the pandemic. It had been assumed, as always, that it would carry off the elderly and infirm, but he realised that children were dying and young people and he took immediate action, closing schools and places of entertainment. He organized the distribution of 35,000 people, to, of 30, 35,000 leaflets telling people how to avoid infection and giving instructions for the isolation of those that did get infected. He organized the distribution of free food, baby's milk in particular, to combat the effects of malnutrition during the pandemic. His measures worked. The death rate in Manchester was much lower than the national average. Stratford had a patchy response to the uh, pandemic, I have to say. Um, there was little reason to believe at the early stages that there was anything abnormal about it. It appeared to have spent itself by August 1918, but it was back in no uncertain terms in September. This second wave may have been brought into Stratford by 60 officers and men of the United States Army Air Force who were entertained in the town. Ironically, in the same month, the US government suspended the draft in an attempt to curb spread of the virus among the armed forces. In one of those extraordinary coincidences that linked that pandemic to the present one, there was uh, on September the 11th, David Lloyd George, the prime minister, arrived in Manchester to be presented with the freedom of the city, his birthplace. Later that evening, he developed a sore throat and fever and collapsed. He spent the next 10 days in a sick room that had been specially created in Manchester Town Hall. He had to wear a respirator. In accordance with the voluntary censorship that he imposed on newspaper editors, the seriousness of his illness was never revealed. But according to his valet, it was touch and go. Part of the horror Spanish flu, as I've said, was it struck younger people more severely than the old. 
45% of the victims were under 36. The cramped and insanitary conditions of wartime camps, trenches and barracks must have contributed. The prolonged wartime sh shortages ensured that people's ability to cope with the infection were much reduced. Winter was coming on and was a deficiency of fuel and warm clothing. Spirits were much in demand, this is in Stratford, to allay the effects of the disease, but such was their scarcity that doctors had to issue vouchers to licensed victuals requesting them to supply small quantities to applicant. The Reverend Arbuthnot must have been turning in his grave, but this shade must have been appeased if he had learned that the majority of the prescriptions could not be honoured, not because of the willingness or fear of breaking the law, but because the purveyors had no stocks in hand. The Herald blamed the food department for not releasing the large stocks reported be held in bond. Stratford's medical office of health could do little but publish the obvious advice. If every person who is suffering from influenza or guitar recognized that he is a likely source of infection to others, then some of the persons infected by him may die as a result of this infection and took all possible precautions, the present disability and mortality from guitar epidemics could be re materially reduced. Rather like COVID, the influenza virus varied from being so mild that the sufferer scarcely, scarcely knew that he or she had it to a desperate intensity. At its most extreme, a person could be fine and healthy at breakfast and be dead by tea time. Within hours of feeling the first symptoms of fatigue, fever and headache, victims would rapidly develop pneumonia and start turning blue, signalizing, signaling a shortage of oxygen. They would struggle for air until they suffocated. One recalls the words of Thomas Decker about the plague in 1603. Many who had health in the morning lay in their graves at night. Crowds of sufferers overwhelmed the doctor's surgeries in Stratford. In many of them, half the staff had been stri stricken. Then as now, mask wearing became general. Entire households were infected and unable to obtain any assistance. The schools were closed and an entertainment at the theatre cancelled. In the last week of October, funerals reached record levels. At the workhouse, nine deaths occurred in a month. At the worst extreme, two or three members of the same family were struck down. Each death was a little tragedy beyond mere numbers. The Meadows family in Arden Street lost two of their children. Corporal James Harrington of the Hampshire Regiment had been billeted with the family when his regiment was stationed at Stratford in 1915. He had walked out with Rose Edith, one of the daughters of the house. The Stratfordians were horrified to hear that the regiment had suffered a disaster at Calipoli. Only 150 survived from a muster of 1,050. Jack Harrington was one of those who attended a memorial service in Holy Trinity for those who had fallen. It was probably at this time that he pledged his troth with his sweetheart, Rose Elias. The marriage was arranged for his demob, but with the domestic tragedy in the bride's family, it was postponed. A sad aspect of the pandemic was that some of those who had endured up to four years of hardship, deprivation and conflict in the trenches returned home only to succumb the, to the virus. One such was Norman Kinman. Maybe I could see Alec there, probably will remember the uh, Kinman's fishmongers uh, where the old, underneath the old corn exchange, right opposite the town hall. Um, he was a member of that family. He had been the finest of the generation of Stratford sportsmen before turning professional with the Australian Rugby League Club, Balmain Tigers, returning shortly before the war broke out. He had been a bombardier with the territorial unit of the 1st Warwickshire Battery of the Royal Horse Artillery and was called up on August the 4th, 1914, that's the first day. He fought in some of the severest actions over the next four years, receiving the Military Medal and Bar, the most decorated Stratfordian of the Great War. On April the 28th, 1916, while a month on month's home league, he married a Stratford girl, Kitty Adams. He became something of a legend in Stratford. Although many times in the thick of the fighting, it was said of him, with the battery, he enjoyed remarkable immunity from the Hun shell and shrapnel. But on November the 30th, 1917, he was digging out some men who had been buried by a shell blast when the Germans sent over some gas canisters. Next thing he knew, he woke up in hospital in Rouen. By January, he was back in Stratford. He and Kitty set up house at 77 Clopton Road. He must have made some recovery from his injuries, for in that month, Kitty became pregnant. In February, he received his discharge and found a position as a commercial clerk at Flowers Brewery. Sadly, both husband and wife were prostrated by the disease. 
Kitty gave birth to a son on October the 27th, but died the next day. Norman fought hard against the malady, but his constitution had been severely undermined by his privations and the shock of his bereavement. Kiss's sister brought up the baby. A month after the death of Norman Kinman, the Herald recorded the death of Gunner William Tovey, Turvey of 41 Ely Street at the age of 23, a victim of the virus after serving right through the war without a scratch. He had volunteered in 1914 and been through the heavy fighting at Mons, Luce and Ypres. When Stratford's War Memorial was unveiled on February the 17th, 1922, the name of Norman Kimron was inscribed amongst the fallen. Despite the fact he had survived the war, obtained a job and started a family. It was clearly considered locally that whatever the official thinking, it was the war that had done for him and untold numbers of his colleagues. Schools returned at the Lent, start of the Lent term on January the 9th, 1919. Overall, then as now, the response, as I've said to the crisis, was patchy. The Medical Office of Health's advice was largely ignored and a great deal of social mixing occurred. The mop occurred, that's an amazing thought, isn't it, on October the 12th, 1918, we didn't get it last year, at the height of the flu crisis. A large crowd greeted the arrival of a tank of a tank that was parked in Bridge Street as a symbol of Stratford's contribution to the war effort. The Herald commented that once peace came, large numbers of Americans now serving on the continent would be sure to want to visit England and Stratford was sure to be on their itinerary, which would contribute greatly to the town's economic regeneration. And you will remember that it was the Americans that had brought it over in the first place. Um, so um, on uh, 23rd of December, 19, uh, 1918, the actor manager Sir Frank Benson was in Stratford to discuss plans for the festival the following April. He faced huge difficulties. Many of his company had been, not been demobbed and some would never return. The flu must have had some effect, although it was never mentioned. As late as March, Benson was unsure what play he, he was going to present in the festival in the event he put on the ones most suited to his sparse army of available talents. Large social gatherings took place during the flu epidemic. A sumptuous dinner was held at the Shakespeare for returning prisoners of war. A well-attended formal luncheon was held to celebrate the signing of the peace treaty in June, 1918. Uh, there's a picture of it, you probably can't see it, but it was very well, um, absolutely packed out and there was no social distancing whatsoever in the midst of it. There were strong moves to get sporting fixtures back on the agenda the golf club was first back, but since fewer of its members had fought in the war than those of other sporting clubs, this was hardly surprising. The first round of the Stratford Football Club was played on Easter Monday, in other words, several months after the normal start of the football season. The first rugby match took place two days later. As I've said, social distancing was not a feature of Stratford streets during the pandemic. By March 1919, again, this is the height of the epidemic, Complaints were rising that the streets were filled with, quote, youngsters who seem more disposed to obstruct our pavements and indulge in horseplay than do any work that will help the general well-being. It was a lot easier to honour dead heroes than live ones, I, con I conclude. The return of the heroes brought another scourge from afar. In May 1919, the County Council adv advertised free treatment for all persons who are suffering from diseases such as syphilis or gonorrhea at special treatment centres. Strict privacy would be observed and no medical card was necessary. The affliction was clearly a speciality for practitioners of quack medicine for it was pointed out that the Venereal Diseases Act of 1917 made it illegal for anyone other than a duly qualified medical practitioner for reward either direct or indirect to treat any person for venereal disease or prescribe any remedy or give any advice in connection with the treatment thereof. It is curious that such a huge pandemic appears to have been compar made comparatively little impact, particularly when it was so much more severe than the current crisis we're facing now, where we, we get, can't switch on the news without it being fully occupied by COVID. And that applies both locally and globally. From November last up to the present, wrote the Herald on March the 21st, 1919, again the height of the crisis, we have experienced continuous rain and the winter has proved one of the 
one of snowstorms, floods, and sombre skies. No, note, no mention, you'll notice, of the flu. Part of the explanation lies in the fact that in a time of war, the government discouraged the publication of news that could affect the national morale. In 1918, the war was by no means won, and indeed it could still have been lost. The national mood was also such as expressed by phrases such as stiff upper lip and we can take it. At a time when thousands had perished in the war, people had assumed a stoical attitude towards death. In the prevailing mood, no one would have wanted the restraints imposed by the war to continue. So where did we go from here? Certain it is that this is not the last of the pandemics. We could do worse, as I conclude, than ponder the simple advice of Dr. James Niven. So far as one can judge at present in checking further outbreaks, it will be necessary to rely chiefly on general preventative net measures. That sounds pretty familiar. So what do you think? Can we draw any lessons from our forebears? Someone who I spoke to recently who works at the BBC told me that they'd been told to put a cheery gloss on things. That sounds rather not unlike um, the attitude in 1918 when uh, they didn't want to reduce morale. Um, we, we actually have the highest death rate per million in the world and our much lauded vaccination system is all right on the first dose but we're below everywhere in Europe on the second dose. Are we going through the same thing, quite understandably, of an attempt to boost us? Well, that's my little view of the pandemic or the various pandemics that have taken place in Stratford. And um, maybe I can't guarantee to answer all questions or anything like that, or, but I'd like to hear your views on whether we've, we can learn anything from the past and what we can take into the future. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.